name's Dr Anna Machen and I'm an evolutionary anthropologist from the University of Oxford. And I've been asked to talk about uh, the evolution of social behaviour tonight. Uh, humans are unique in terms of our romantic relationships because both sexes are choosy when it comes to choosing a mate. And generally, in mammals, it's actually the female who chooses her mate, simply because she's the one that invests the most in bringing up the children. Really, for, for male mammals, mostly, the only input they have is sexual intercourse. Then they leave, and it's the female who obviously just takes the baby and then feeds it after it's born. However, humans are slightly different for two reasons. We have very, very big brains, the size of our bodies, and also we walk on two legs, and this makes childbirth a little bit tricky. So we, when we give birth, we give birth to highly dependent offspring. If you compare a chimp baby with a human baby, as soon as they were you can see the difference. The chimp baby's all starting to swing through the trees, and the human baby is very, very helpless. And because we have helpless offspring, we need the fathers to help them in bringing up those offspring. And therefore, the males, for a certain period of time, no more shorter, are taking themselves out to the mating market, and therefore, they become a little bit choosy about who they're going to be. So that's why humans are different. And males, because they're going to be taking themselves out of the market, they want an absolute guarantee that they're going to get a very nice baby at the end of it. And therefore they look for youth and signs of fertility when they want to meet a partner. Whereas females, they want to have signs of loyalty and also the ability to provide, because the whole idea of the male being there is that he will invest in the offspring, he will provide food, he will provide shelter, and he will help to protect that offspring. And that's why humans are actually different to the majority of other mammals. If you look, for example, at um, dating ads in the newspaper, and you look at what men ask for, and you look at what women ask for, those biological imperatives actually come through in what they're looking for in their partner. So a man will often ask for somebody who's a uh, size 10 to size 12, blonde, blue eyes, young. Okay, and those are all signs of fertility, right? And whereas a woman will often ask for a professional, owns their own home, um, a sense of humour, um, a good, dependable job. Okay, and that's where that biological imperative comes through today, and what we're actually choosing when we look at the part. Some of the more complicated things um, that seem to be coming out now is quite often people will say things like, um, you know, what's, what's the impact of things like being able to fake, for example, as a woman, your youth or your fertility. So, for example, being able to have cosmetic surgery to make yourself look younger. What impact is that having? And the problem with the evolutionary world point of view is that's actually not been happening for very long. So we can't actually see how that's going to maybe alter the way men pick their women, because we don't actually know yet. But that would be quite interesting to see actually the effect that we now have the technology to actually alter what we look like, which in a way is sort of a fake signal, because it's not really reflecting anything about our biology. But we'll have to wait probably a couple of thousand years before we can work out whether that's had any effect on it. Hello, uh, I'm Tony Little, and I'm a psychologist who's interested in the biology of mate choice in humans. Uh, and what I'm primarily interested in is facial appearance and facial attractiveness. So what sort of traits make certain faces more or less attractive? And there are a variety of traits in faces uh, that we propose to be important, things like skin health uh, and things like symmetry. Uh, what I'm also interested in is whether people agree within a particular culture on certain traits and the extent of disagreement across different populations. So symmetry provides a nice example. So, you can show people pictures of symmetric and asymmetric faces, and we can do that in the UK, do that in Africa, do it in countries around the world, and you can assess the agreement on that particular trait. When it comes to symmetry, when you do that, you find that the UK, Australia, America, and Africa countries, symmetry is found to be an attractive trait. Now, uh, so while you might have broad agreement on, on some traits like symmetry, uh, you can also have individual variation in certain preferences in humans, uh, what you see is broad assortment for various traits, so things like height and weight. Uh, but interestingly, you also see patterns of facial matching, so married couples tend to look more alike than you would expect by chance. Uh, you do, of course, get uh, cultural differences themselves for various uh, uh, things. So one thing uh, that people seem to disagree on quite a lot is preferences for masculinity and male faces. Masculinity being how big jaws are uh, in, in men. Uh, and within cultures, between cultures, you see quite a lot of variation whether femininity in men is preferred or masculinity in men is preferred. Uh, 
and some recent studies are suggesting that preferences for masculinity may be related to parasite load and disease within particular cultures. So the more disease within a particular culture, the higher the preferences for masculinity within that culture. And this might be explained because uh, masculinity is associated with health, and therefore preferences for health in countries with, with poor health may be more evolutionary.